connective tissue and, and glands, followed by a series of muscular layers. So, again, from the inside out, this is the view of the inside of the intestine. These are the villi. And how do the villi form? Well, we've spent a fair amount of time in my lab working on that previously. I, when I give seminars, I, I like to talk about things that are not yet published. So the story of how the villi form is something that's already published. But I want to take you through it briefly because it sets the stage for what I'll talk about next. So we know that in the adult intestine, the villi are maintained by stem cells that are at the base of the villi and they keep them grow. But embryologically, the formation of the villi in the first place is not a stem cell phenomenon. It's a folding phenomenon. To understand that, let me take you through the steps that this is in the chick, but it'll be this, it's actually a bit different in the mouse. But the human gut forms just the way the chicken does. You start with a smooth lumen, shown here in a drawing, or here is an actual photograph, in the E7's embryo, embryological day seven, seven days of incubating the chick egg, just because just it's chicken. But the initially you have a tube, it's got an endoderm, and it's surrounded by some mesoderm. A day later, that's been transformed from smooth lining into a series of ridges that run the whole length of the gut. A couple days later, those ridges have become to, themselves have become deformed into zigzags. And finally, those zigzags break apart into individual villi, where not the corners, but each zig and zag of a villus, uh, sorry, of, a, of a, the ridges, gives rise to an individual villus. So this is not stem cells moving around, this is folding of the tissue. And the key to understanding how that occurs came with the observation that the timing of these different steps correlates perfectly with the timing of the different muscle layers of the gut. I should point out, we go back, that the muscle layers of the gut that are on the outside come in two different directions. There's this circular muscle or circumferential muscle that goes around the gut, and then there are other layers, for example this layer here, that runs the length of the gut, going in and out of the plane of the board. So the first change from smooth lumen to these ridges occurs simultaneously with the formation of the first layer of muscle, which is a circumferential rust layer that goes around the, oops, it goes around the gut. And you can see that here. This is a stain for the smooth muscle, smooth muscle actin. And, all, and it's showing you that these fibers are running circumferentially around the gut. And that these differentiate as, these, as the smooth lumen buckles into a series of ridges. Then, exactly when you go from ridges to zigzags, when you go, on, go this transition, the second layer of smooth muscle forms on the outside of the first layer. And that outside layer is running in and out of the plane of the board. And then, exactly when you go Exactly when you go from zigzags to villi is when the next muscle layer forms. On the inside here, another one that's going in and out of the plane of the board. So there's coincidence in timing. What we think is going on is the following. That initially, you have a gut tube that's proliferating, the inside endoderm proliferating, all the mesoderm proliferating. It all proliferates and it just gets larger. But once the muscle differentiates, the muscle doesn't proliferate as quickly. And it becomes a barrier. It's just stiff. All the stuff on the inside keeps proliferating, but it has nowhere to go. So it buckles and forms these ridges. And so initially, it buckles this way because it's constrained from expanding outward. Then it's constrained in two different dimensions. You've got now constraint preventing it from expanding lengthwise as well. And finally, the last step also involves a change in proliferation, but to, also with coincident with a further stiffening of the layers of the, of the muscle. So to get the formation of the villi requires that the muscle forms in, this, in these sequential layers, first circumferential, then lo longitudinal, then a second longitudinal layer. These muscle layers are also, of course, very important in the adult. These are the muscles that allow the food to move through your gut. So that as the gut moves to the lumen, you have the, the um, 
contraction of the circumferential muscles here, pushing on the food, at the same time as you have the relaxation of the longitudinal muscles here, giving you more space to move the food down the gut. So getting these muscle layers embryonically to form in the right place in the right orientation is critical both for formation of the villi and also critical for adult physiology. So the first little, um, story I want to tell you is how do you get, if you're going to build a structure, we're talking about how you build the intestine, how do you get the muscle layers in the right place and how do you get them with the right orientation? So you, you, know, you have an anatomy, an anatomy textbook will tell you, oops, sorry, an anatomy textbook will tell you that you've got these different layers and that they're oriented in different directions and I've said it's very important that they be there, but how do you get them there in the first place? So, these layers are circumferential, uh, uh, sorry, are, are cir these different layers of muscle, shown here again with the acting stain, are sort of uh, concentric circles. You can see that there's one within the next, within the next. Mm -hmm. One surrounded by the next, by the next. And this sort of bullseye target sort of um, orientation is something that in developmental biology immediately makes one think of radial signals. If you've got a radial organization, one thinks of radial signals. And so the paradigm for that came from Drosophila. In flies, we know that both in terms of getting concentric domains of expression in the leg disc that ultimately become the different segments of the leg, or in butterflies, giving you the beautiful patterns of the eye spots. Both of these are set up by the same series of, of transcription factors and signals. What they involve is having a transcription factor discalus expressed in the very middle, which turns on ultimately as a secreted protein, wingless. And then wingless diffuses out, and at different threshold concentrations, you get different responses. So that's sort of the paradigm. That to get concentric layers, one thinks about having signals that either coming from the inside, or I guess in principle it could come from the outside. But if you've got a radial organization, you think of radial signals. So the, we have a radial signal. We've known that for a long time. Um, in, back in 1995, my lab was involved in cloning the vertebrate hedgehog genes. And one of the vertebrate hedgehog genes is sonic hedgehog. Sonic is produced by the endoderm, the entire endoderm of the, of the primitive gut tube. And, you can, and that's on the inside. So if you need it, and it's a secreted morphogen, it's a signal that cells respond to. So if you needed something that would be made and get, give you a different radial organization, it's a very good candidate. And indeed, it does form a gradient. So this is uh, just a marker for response. This is the gene patch, which is the receptor for hedgehog. But more importantly, it's upregulated in response to hedgehog. And you can see that, number one, it's not being upregulated in the endoderm itself. That is, the cells that express hedgehog do not respond to it. But in the mesoderm, the cells right underneath the, ed the endoderm are expressing a very high level of patch. And then there's a gradient of expression from there. So you've got a graded signal. And we can find various genes that are expressed at various thresholds. Genes that only come out when you have a very high level of hedgehog. Genes that come out when you have a lower level of hedgehog. So this was a very good candidate for thinking about the gene that might set up the place where the layers would form. Now prior to our thinking about this, other laboratories had investigated the role of hedgehog in gut development. So hedgehog has been knocked out, and also the downstream signal smoothened, the signal transduction molecule smoothened has been knocked out. And a couple different labs, Andy McMahon and, and, um, and Phil Beachy's laboratories both showed that if you remove the hedgehog pathway, you get a loss of smooth muscle. So if the removal means loss of smooth muscle, then it says that hedgehog indeed is required to make smooth muscle. But the literature was confusing because other investigators in Japan looking in the chick system in vitro got the opposite result. They said that if you block hedgehog with a drug that blocks hedgehog signaling called cyclopamine, as they decreased hedgehog signaling, they got more smooth muscle. And conversely, if they put an extra hedgehog, they stopped having any smooth muscle. So more hedgehog is getting rid of muscle Hedgehog is necessary to make muscle, so there seemed to be a contradiction there. But if one thinks about morphogens and gradients, there was an obvious possible solution. That is that both these experiments could be telling you the truth. That maybe at high concentration, 
it does block this formation of muscle. So if you add hedgehog in vitro, you block the muscle. But it, you need to have hedgehog at a lower concentration to induce the muscle. And that would give you both the results shown in the last slide and give you a way of thinking about how you could get the muscle at the right location. So a graduate student in my lab, Tyler Huck, decided to investigate this. He took a gut tube, put it in a dish, and grew it in culture for 48 hours. Okay. Um, okay, so grew it for, for 48 hours. And in doing that, you see that the smooth muscle layer differentiated. And then you could say and that's the control in a dish. You could say, what happens if you add hedgehog? And if you add a little bit of hedgehog, you indeed get more muscle. This is what the Japanese group uh, This is consistent with the mouse genetics saying that you need hedgehog in, in order to have smooth muscle. You add more hedgehog, you get more smooth muscle. But if you add enough hedgehog, you lose it completely consistent with the other group's findings. So it seems to be a threshold res response. Now, there are two ways in principle you can get that sort of response. One is the way that I sort of implied originally, which is a bit, it was a bit um, false because I knew that it wasn't actually correct. But one way would be like this, where the same signal is both inducing and blocking the smooth muscle. But an alternative way that this could work would be that hedgehog could induce a second signal and that hedgehog was, is always inducing muscle if it can, but you have a second signal that blocks the formation of muscle. And that second signal comes out at a high threshold in response to, to hedgehog signaling, but not at a lower threshold. And we sort of had a hint that there was a second signal from the fact this slide I showed you earlier, I didn't tell you what some of these genes that come out in response to hedgehog were. This is BMP4 which is another secreted protein. And you can see it only comes on directly under the endoderm. BMP4 is a gene that requires a lot of hedgehog to come out. So that suggested that Sonic is inducing BMP4, and they, then BMP4 could be what was responsible for the repressing the formation of muscle. So this is just testing it. This just, just shows that hedgehog is indeed sufficient to induce BMP4. So as you add more and more hedgehog, you get more and more BMP4. And in fact, it's also necessary because if you block hedgehog signal with like dopamine, then you have no BMP4. So hedgehog is necessary and sufficient to induce BMP4. So hedgehog is upstream of BMP4. And BMP4, in fact, correlates very nicely with the domain where there's no smooth muscle. So this is the endogenous expression of BMP4. And you can see that there's no smooth muscle where BMP4 is expressed. If you add hedgehog and expand the domain of BMP4, you do get more muscle out of it, but you've also expanded the region where there's, um, where, there's no, where there's no smooth muscle. And finally, if you have BMP4 everywhere, with enough hedgehog, you induce it everywhere. With, it, with BMP4 everywhere, then you get no smooth muscle. So to see if BMP4 really is directly responsible, we can just add BMP4. And you can show that um, this is, again, the control. As you add more and more BMP4, you lose the expression of uh, you lose the expression of the smooth muscle act, and you lose smooth muscle. So we've got a situation where the reason you're not getting any smooth muscle here is because you have high hedgehog signaling inducing BMP4, but you get smooth muscle here because you're beyond the BMP4 and you still have hedgehog, which is necessary to induce it. You also need to block the muscle from going out to the edge. And it turns out there are other BMPs, BMP4 in particular, uh, BMP2 in particular, that are being BMP2 in particular that are expressed out here at the periphery. This is a different BMP2, the different BMP expressed independently of hedgehog out here at the edge, where it can act to suppress the formation of smooth muscle laterally. So you have BMP downstream of hedgehog here a second BMP out here, and together they block the formation of smooth muscle either here or here, leaving it just in that sweet spot in the middle where there's not enough BMP4. So you have a gradient of hedgehog inducing, hedgehog inducing smooth muscle, but it can only induce it here where there's no BMPs. Now that's fine for the first layer, but I told you you could see other layers forming sequentially. 
and you have to let, somehow get the next layer to form, the first layer is already formed. That time goes by. How do you then get second layers to form here and here? Well, one way that that can occur would be if you could somehow get dampen the BMP gradients here and here, push them back to make room for targets for muscle differentiation here and here. So you want to make some additional smooth muscle layers there. It turns out that as smooth muscle differentiates, it expresses a potent inhibitor of BMP signaling called noggin. So you see noggin is expressed. This is the smooth muscle acting again. As the smooth muscle differentiates, it makes a BMP inhibitor. And if you add that inhibitor early, if you add the inhibitor at an earlier stage, everything turns to muscle right at the start. So normally, because of the BMPs that are expressed out here, smooth muscle only is, is expressed down here. And, but before the noggin is ever expressed here, if you add noggin prematurely, basically everything turns to muscle. And I say everything, you can see this DAPI sting, there's some cells that are not turning to muscle there, but those are actually enteric neurons. So that all of the mesoderms turn into smooth muscle prematurely if you add noggin and get rid of the BMP signal. So that says that, that, that the suggestion is that you need to have noggin made by the smooth muscle, the first layer, in order for the second layers to form. So to show that, we turn to mouse genetics. Oops. The mouse genetics, noggin's been knocked out. In the mouse here, the E16 and a half, at this stage, you have two layers of muscle, the circumferential layer and the first longitudinal layer in the control mouse. Richard Harlan's knocked the gene out. Now, he didn't report any phenotype in the smooth muscle. But if, you, if one of these layers was missing in a knockout mouse, you wouldn't notice it unless you intentionally looked for it. So we got the mouse from Richard and took a closer look. And sure enough, if, you, if, this, if there's no noggin, which means this layer can't make noggin, the next layer never forms. Now that's at E16 and a half. We couldn't look later than that because the mice die in the noggin mutant. So we got a conditional allele of noggin and knocked it out conditionally in the smooth muscle cells. And if you do that, you almost get rid of it. So this is a, the control. This is at a later stage in the, uh, in the conditional knockout. You can see that there actually is some, um, some expression of smooth muscle actin. So at a later stage, eventually, there's some differentiation. What I didn't tell you, and I don't have time to really go through the additional genes, in addition to noggin, this, the layer of smooth muscle produces other, other antagonists of BMPs as well, including cordon and gremlin. So we think that there's some redundancy there. And if you got rid of all of the BMP antagonists then you, made by this layer, you wouldn't get this at all. All right, so we think we understand how you get the layers forming sequentially. You start by having hedgehog signaling, inducing smooth muscle, blocked out here and here by BMP signaling. Then this layer produces noggin, and when noggin comes on, it, it pushes these gradients back, allowing longitudinal layers to form on either side. But that's only half the puzzle. The other half of the puzzle is that these layers also have orientation. They've got cells that are going longitudinally and circumferentially, circumferentially and in and out of the plane of the board. So how do they get the right orientation? Well, we had some clues to that from tissue engineers. So tissue engineers are people who don't think as deeply about the, the underlying biological mechanisms, but are very interested in manipulating tissues and trying to figure out how to manipulate them. And in particular, one of the things that there's been a lot of work on by a number of tissue engineering groups is making vascular tissue in vitro. And vascular tissue has muscle, so they're interested in how do you align the musculature, the smooth muscle, of the vasculature. What they find, found is that if you have a stretch that you can do with a machine, you can put the cells or the tissue on a, on a machine and physically stretch it. If you stre without stretch, the smooth muscle layers in vitro will align at random. But if you stretch it, they line parallel to the stretch. Okay? And we thought about that there is a stretch going on in the case of the, of the gut. So if, if you think about, the pointer just died. Okay, it's all right. So if, 
So as long as this works. So as the inner part of the, the um, as the inner part of the intestine is proliferating and growing, it's pushing outward on the smooth muscle. And I told you before, the smooth muscle doesn't proliferate as much. So you've got the inner inside pushing that's going to give you tension, and the tension will run this way. It's the same thing as in blowing up a balloon. As you blow up a balloon, the stretch is not inside out. The stretch is on the surface, right? And you can show that there is this sort of situation if you have a, um, if you take a, a gut and cut the smooth muscle, the interior part away from the smooth muscle. All this part that was on the inside, if the smooth muscle isn't there, expands. Because it was cramped in there. It was stuck, pushing outward, but it couldn't go anywhere. Conversely, as soon as you take this stuff out of there, the muscle layer contracts inward because it was under stretch. So you can obviously get rid of the stretch just by cutting it open. Now, you, now this layer can proliferate all at once and it can just spread out and it's no longer stretching this tissue. Right? So you can say, let's grow these guts in, vit in vitro either as a, a tube or as a flat sheet. The prediction would be this will form fibers that run this way, whereas here, the fibers should be random. And that's exactly what you see. So in the control, this is just imaging down. You can see the fibers are all aligned. Whereas if you do it flat, there's no alignment. And you can see that if you quantify it, you have a very sharp alignment, only in this case, but not if it's flat. So we think that first layer orients parallel to the strain that's produced by the radial stretching. It's stretching out, you've got strain in this orientation, and that aligns the fibers in that orientation. That's fine for the first layer. But now the next layer is not going to align that way. The next layer is going to align in and out of the plane of the board. How do you suddenly get them aligning in a different direction? And again, the tissue engineers gave us the clue to that. And the tissue engineers, as I said, they don't really think about the biology. So I don't have an explanation for why this is true. This is phenomenological. Okay, well, that just says, why do the adolescent layers get different orientation? This is, again, taken from tissue engineering literature. If instead of just stretching the tissue, you stretch it and relax it, you do it cyclically. So a 20% stretch, one, for one second stretch, one stretch, second relax, and you're stretching in this orientation, if you do it cyclically, instead of aligning along the stretch, they line perpendicular. I have no idea why. This is just a this is again smooth muscle, but the, the, this is the data taken from this paper. And there's lots and lots of this in the literature with, with vascular smooth muscles. If you apply a cyclic stretch, instead of being random, they align perpendicular to the stretch rather than parallel to it. So that at least gave us an idea of what might be going on. And the reason we thought it might be going on, you can start to hit the movie. I, with this clicker, I can't do movies. Yep. What you will see is as soon as the first layer forms, it starts squeezing. See, it's peristaltic. Now, it's not coordinated. It's just going at random because the enteric nervous system isn't there yet. But you've got this, thank you, um, you've got this stretch that's much larger than the internal stretch of expansion. So you've got a bigger force, and it's cyclic. And that stretch, importantly for what I'm going to show you next, can be manipulated because the stretch is dependent on calcium flux. So if you have the next slide, uh, the next movie. So this is just a dye for calcium. And what you can see is these calcium transits. You will in a second. Well, what you might see, oh, there, okay, right here, there, there, there are the calcium, so you see the calcium pulses. So they're disorganized, they're random, they're not coordinated, but, um, okay, so next slide, so I've lost my clicker, next, next, next slide, thank you, so, so now you can, no, no, go back, 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 
Flux, then you're not going to get this peristalsis. Movie? So this one, you can just see it's happening here, it's not happening here. So this is with drug, this is the control, this is with the drug. And you can see that the, the um, the second layer is, if you add the drug, you lose the orientation. Even though the orientation of the first layer doesn't change. So this is the circumferential layer being imaged this way. This is the second layer, it's perpendicular. But without the calcium flux, you don't get that. You can also speed up, the, there are also drugs that increase the rate of this happening. Movie. You see, this one just starts dancing. It's a, just a very fat. <laughs> there you go. So you you speed up the, the, the peristalsis relative to this. And if you speed it up, you get even more alignment. So here you have normal alignment. Here you have no contractions. Here you have more contractions. And again, you can quantify that. The more contractions you have, the more they are aligned. And we got one of these machines ourselves. The, the, the tissue engineering machines we use the Strex cell system. So we can ask now, that the previous ones were done with vascular, vascular tissue. This is with the, the types of uh, cells that we use. We can say, if you take this and you stretch it continuously, what happens? So if you, you either don't stretch it or you stretch it continuously, you stretch it continuously and it aligns with the fibers. Or you can stretch it, and, oh, and in this, that experiment, if you stretch it continuously, artificially, you can add the, the drug that blocks peristalsis, it doesn't matter, right? Because the peristalsis is only needed if you don't stretch it. If you stretch it, then you get the alignment even if the pedophine is around. And so the nepetophene doesn't block the alignment of the muscle, it blocks the, the contractions. So if you block the contractions, but then still stretch it, you're achieving the same thing. And you can also do the cyclic stretch. And if you do cyclic stretch, now it's orienting perpendicular to the line. And one final one is here in this case, we're taking the intact gut rather than tissues. We add the rather than cells. And we add the pedophene, so now the second layer of smooth muscle should be disorganized. But now you, were, you give a cyclic stretch to the tissue and say, in the intact two, can you get that second layer aligned? The only problem with this is what you really want to do would be to have it cyclically this way. We can't do it. We're going cyclically this way, which means that we're orient we are hopefully going to orient, well, otherwise we'd be disorganized, but we're going to orient them in the opposite direction than they normally would endogenously. So that's here. So normal development, they're aligned. With the pedophene, they're at random. And cyclic stretch lengthwise, they align perpendicularly. Okay, so what I told you in the first part of the talk is if you want to make a gut, you have to get these different layers of muscle in the right place with the right orientation. The right place comes from gradients of hedgehog and BMPs and, and the first muscle making noggin, changing the shape of the gradients, giving you sweet spots where hedgehog can act giving you different layers of muscle. And the orientation comes from physical parameters. And again, we haven't done any biophysical experiments in my lab to understand why cyclic stretch acts differently from constant stretch. And it's not in the literature, so it's just phenomenological. But we know that there is a constant stretch on the first set of muscles, and that orients them circumferentially. And there is a pulsatile cyclic stretch that the second layers are encountering, and that makes them align perpendicularly. All right, so now I'm going to change gears completely. So that's, so that's the type of developmental biology that we do, trying to understand how do you make structures in the developing embryo, what are the pathways involved. And then we take them, and we are, in fact, doing evo studies on the gut, saying, okay, well, animals that have different 
thicknesses of their muscle, or different regions of the gut that have different thicknesses of muscle, or that have different types, different lengths of villi. How are these pathways varied to give you that sort of difference? But the evolutionary story I'm going to tell you, the story from the second, from the second half of the talk, as I said, is actually not about development, but it's more metabolic. So how to survive in a cave. And this is working on a system that you are all, I think, fairly familiar with because Patty works on it. Um, it's the Mexican cave fish, Asianus mexicanus. But I'm going to start by setting it up by talking about people. So here's a group of, of animals. Now, the, the guys in the center are, happen to be Africans because that's about the only place in the world where you find people living that primitively at this point. But if you went back five, ten thousand years, that's how we're all living, right? So that's all of us. So you look at us in the middle and these animals on the outside. What are the differences between them? And the couple things that immediately come to mind is that they don't have fur. They're using tools. There, there are some obvious things that most people would think of. But I will submit to you that one of the most fundamental differences about these guys in the middle is that they're horrendously fat. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> so first of all, we, we tend to, we're, uh, this is just we're a fat species. This is data from the American Council on Exercise of how much body fat men or women have in what's considered obese, average, fit, etc. But what really matters is up here, the essential fat, the amount of fat you can't do without. So, I mean, you wouldn't, by our standards, Usain Bolt, who was a great athlete, wasn't fat. He had about 8% body fat. Because that's getting pushing down on the essential level. Elite marathon runners, men get down to about 6 or 7% of the marathon runners. Female marathon runners are in the 15 to 16%. Even people who are on the verge of death from starvation, women with severe anorexia, um, men who came from, and it's men from a concentration camp, because the data came from a Japanese concentration camp from World War II. Obviously, other concentration camps would have had um, females as well, but this is taken from a prisoner of war camp where they were starved. In any case, they get down to 4.5% or 12 to 14%, and then they die. You can't get all of that, right? Well, let's look at other animals. Let's look at our nearest relative. This is a bonobo. The bonobo body composition can be measured. 0.01% body fat in this guy. 0.01. That's a 200-fold difference. Not only are we fat as adults, but we're born fat. <laughs> Our babies are born with 15 to 20 percent body fat, whereas bonobo is only 3 percent body fat. And I can show you just one primate, but at birth we are the fattest mammal that doesn't live in the ocean. So here's all this the body fat, the body fat cetaceans aren't on there, so you have no porpoises or whales. Leaving them aside because they have obviously very special constraints of, of insulation. Human body fat at birth. Most of the others that have some high body fat are partially in the water, like harp seals or fur seals or seal. I don't know why they bought guinea pigs are so fat. But, and then other things, you know, animals like bears or mice are out here. We're way up here. Now, there's, you can think about why that's true. Is it because we, babies are born without fur and they need insulation? Well, mice are born without fur. They're not born that fat. A lot of thought has to do with needing fuel and lipids for rapid brain growth. And that's possible. That, that could be part of it. But whatever the reason is, we're fat and we're getting fatter. This is, this is a, in the United States, I don't know about Mexico, maybe in Mexico you're not. I personally am getting fat. This could be me actually. So, um, but you can see the level of obesity is going way up. And with this epidemic and obesity in North America, or in the United States in any case, with the rise in obesity, you have concomitant diseases, right? Diabetes, type 2 diabetes is an enormous epidemic in our country. I should have checked the statistics here because I really don't know them, but along with that, it, obese people can get fatty liver disease. These big fat globules called steatosis destroying the liver. Very, very dangerous. Now, as an aside, I'll take a step back. I'll come back to the story in a second. But because I don't really do things in terms of translation. I don't, my lab, even though I'm at a medical school and chairman of a department of medical school, I don't really think about diseases or people that much, which is kind of weird. But, but, um, but if you think about 
How do we treat these diseases? Well, the best thing to do would be just to avoid it, not to get diabetes in the first place. If you have diabetes, we try and give medicines that attack the, the, the reverse the disease. For example, insulin, obviously, is the, is the main cure. And if you can perfect an insulin pump, well, ultimately between stem cells and various other things, I'm sure diabetes will be curable. But I'm going to raise the possibility there's another thing you, that you could do. What if instead of curing the, the, the disease or what, treating it, you just made it so it didn't matter? Is it, and we're going to come back to this, but what if this concept, what if you were diabetic and you just, it, it made no difference in your life whatsoever? You had a fatty liver and you just went around being happy with a fatty liver. Now that sounds crazy, but what you'll see in a few slides, it's actually not such a crazy thing at all. All right, not only are Americans getting fatter, but the interesting thing is different subpopulations of Americans are being affected by this to a greater or larger extent. So this is taken by a website from Native American population a website where they're trying to highlight the fact and draw attention to the fact that they have a special problem in the American Indians. 31.2% of Native American children between age 2 and 5 are obese. In America, the national average is already horrendous. 12% of our young children are obese. That's 12% for the national average, and it's obese, I mean really fat, 31% of Native Americans. One in 10 Americans get diabetes during their life. One in two Native Americans. This is affecting some populations more than others. And there are lots of reasons why this could be true. There could be cultural differences, so that they have different dietary practices, different foods that they eat that could affect this. Socioeconomic practice uh, effects. It happens that the Native Americans are among our poorer populations, and that may be an important effect of it. Um, but one possibility is that it's actually genetic, or that a component's genetic. That at least this, one could put out the idea that these are people who not too long ago were living subsistence of, in, in a subsistence way. And they had to go through periods of severe shortages. They had to go through periods of harsh winters when they would starve. That, people with my ethnicity didn't have to deal with for tens of for 5,000 years. And because of that, they developed very efficient metabolisms to make use of what they had. But the downside of that is if you're suddenly in a very rich environment where you have all the food you want, maybe it's not so healthy. So that's a, a possibility, but of course you can't, number one, really investigate really what the, genetic, what the environmental genetic causes are for this in the same way as you could with a laboratory animal. And number two, you certainly can't do genetic experiments. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about Estianix mexicanus. And I know that you guys are, I'm sure that almost all of you, if not all of you, are very familiar with this from Patty, but I'm just going to highlight a few aspects of the system because, uh, oh, these are not fish. These are the people who did the work. This is the postdoc, Miss e. Riddle, graduate student, Ariel Asperis, and another former postdoc, Nick Rohner, who started the project with me in my lab. He's now at the Scholars Institute, and we sort of together have been supervising these two. So it's really a collaborative, co equal collaboration with Nick, and the work was done by Ariel and Missy. So you recognize this region a lot more than I do. This, this is the Sierra de Abra and Sierra de Guatemala ranges, where the various caves are. Fish were swept into the caves maybe a million years ago, maybe less. There's some debate at this point. The fish became trapped in these caves. But the caves are very similar in their conditions. So in similar conditions, they evolved with similar selective pressures. So they evolved very similar phenotypes. So you have fish that are not, not at all directly related to each other. There's no connection between the caves. They're all related to this guy. And so you can look at questions of convergent or parallel evolution. Are the same genetic pathways involved here, here, and here in giving you the same phenotype? Importantly for doing genetics, these are all completely interfertile. The different caves are interfertile with each other, as are the caves and the surface fish. And they can breed and live in the lab, as they do in Patty's lab, as they do in my lab. And we know what the selective pressures are. So this is what the, the rivers look like. And I'm sure all of you have seen rivers in Mexico. They're very lush. There are lots of animals, lots of plants, lots of environment. Some of you may have gone to the caves. This is what caves look like. Right? <laughs> and if you shine a light on it, it doesn't look that different. Here are the little fish, and that's basically all you see, right? So it's a and so this is a very special environment. There's no light, no oxygen, lower oxygens, lower conductivity, higher pH. 
The good news is no one wants to eat you. The bad news is there's nothing to eat. There's sort of a trade-off there. Well, the important thing here is that there's no, for what I'm going to talk about in terms of adapting to low uh, nutrient conditions, if there's no light, there's no photosynthesis. If there's no photosynthesis, then you don't have a primary food chain. The amount of energy in these cases is way less than you have in a regular environment. So with no internal food sources, these guys have to adapt to it. And what they do is they make use of what they can. Nine, nine, for nine to ten months, they're basically starving. Then the rains come. And this was not taken here. This is a picture of a different jungle region. But anyway, rains come. And when the rains come, now you have seasonal showers. You get food into the caves. So the, there's, you have seasonal food. What you want to do is you want to stock up on it. It's like a survivalist, right? If you know an apocalypse is coming, you better store it while you can. Right? So, and that's indeed what these fish do. So, these are fish raised under equivalent conditions in the lab, where you let them eat whatever they want, and they're raised the same way, and you find that the, the cave fish, this is from one particular cave, the name of the cave is, well, this is the name of the cave, it's also the name of the fish that came from that cave. So the Bashan cave fish, the fish from the Bashan cave, are fatter than the surface beds are, okay? And you can see that among the places they put that fat is into the liver. So this is the, the, the surface liver, this is the cave fish liver here, it's huge. Not only is it huge, but it's, if you use oil red to stain for fat, or for lipids, you can see it's just absolutely covered with oil red. This is a really fatty liver, and indeed you can show that they have these big lipid globules, just like human disease livers do, this is steatosis. In humans, this would be a very serious disease. These fish are perfectly happy. They live as long as the, as the surface fish. They have no evidence of liver damage. One of the, in fact, if you give them enough food, the surface fish gets, finally starts having some liver damage, and some liver enzymes, bilirubin and others, are released into the blood. The cave fish, no matter how fat they get, they don't release bilirubin. A human disease, some with fatty liver disease, very high bilirubin. There's no inflammation genes. A big part of the destruction of a fatty liver disease is once fatty liver disease sets in, you get inflammation. No inflammation genes. There's metabolic genes coming in. This is an RNA-seq experiment. So they've basically evolved to have the fatty liver be a, a place to store fat. So this is what I was saying before about, besides treating the disease, what if you have the disease and you should be care? They've got a fatty liver, they just don't care. Now in addition to the fact that they're fatter, they also lose weight very slowly. So if now if you starve them and say how much weight have they lost, the surface fish lose a lot more weight than the cave fish. So you start with fish that are the same starting weight, and you'd say what percentage of their body weight do they lose over what, um, what things might be a two month fast, over a two-month fast, these fish, these tiny fish haven't eaten at all. The river fish have lost 30% of their body weight. Sea fish more like 15%. So they gain weight easily if there's food around, and they lose weight slowly if there's not. So how do you? So that's what you want to do if you want to conserve food. How do you do that? Well, one thing you could think about is maybe they just don't move around, right? This is what we call in North America, in America the couch, being a couch potato, right? You just sit there and eat. No exercise and you eat, and you get fat. And if you don't exercise, you're never going to take that off, right? So is that what these fish are doing? Are they just sitting there like, like couch potatoes? So the next slide, this is a cave fish, this is a surface fish. And just You can see how much slower these guys are moving than these guys. Can you start the movie? Uh, they're not moving slower. These guys are moving, but the, the cave fish are moving much more rapidly. Much more. Now, ecologically, that makes sense. The, in the rivers, there are predators. You don't want to attract attention to yourself. You hide in the bushes until you see an insect larva. You get it, and then you hide again. Whereas the river, the cave fish, there are no predators. They don't have to worry about being seen, but they've got to find food. And there's so little food here, they're constantly looking. So they're constantly moving. But regardless of the ecological reason, these guys are getting fatter while they're exercising more. 
So if they're getting fatter while exercising more, that says they've got to be metabolic differences. So we decided to look at, at metabolism and see if there were differences between the fish. And the first thing we looked at was blood, uh, was blood glucose levels and glucose metabolism, and there sure is a difference. After feeding, so this, this is after they eat, surface fish maintain a constant blood glucose level, as all of us do if you're not diabetic. You want to keep your level, your body has a certain need for glucose. You don't want it to be too high, you don't want it to be too low. So because of the balance of, of, of the um, hormones, insulin and glucagon, when, when you eat, you make more insulin, and you keep the blood sugar constant. Surface fish do that. The river fish, after they eat, these are three different caves. The cave fish, after they eat, their blood glucose goes up. Conversely, if they fast, they make glucagon, they put blood sugar from their liver back in. The river fish, like us, keeping their blood glucose constant in a fast. My blood sugar is the same now as it was at breakfast. It'll be the same again when I eat at dinner. It's, it's constant. The cave fish, if they're not eating, it goes way down. So this is, this is what a diabetic response would be in humans, right? So we decided to look at uh, the, sort of the classic test for diabetes, which is a, glu um, a glucose tolerance test. So now you inject glucose, so, that, so now th those were feeding and starving, now you're injecting glucose into the fish. Of course, as, as soon as you inject glucose, the blood glucose goes up in any fish, you're just putting glucose in. But the river fish immediately gets rid of it, whereas the cave fish takes a long time. It doesn't clear the glucose right away. This is what would be in a human, there's the same levels, absolute levels, that the human would be labeled diabetes. This is not diabetes. Diabetes is a disease. These, this is normal fish. You can't say that they're diabetic fish. They're not diabetic fish because this isn't pathological. They've evolved to live like this. So what's the evolutionary change that's taking place? Well, I mentioned a couple of the hormones before. When you're fasting, there's not enough low, your blood glucose level goes down. So glucagon is produced, which goes to the liver. Glycogen is turned to glucose, and your blood sugar level goes back up. Conversely, if you eat, you have a lot of blood glucose is high, the pancreas makes insulin. The insulin acts to take up glucose in both the liver and the muscle, and the glucose falls in the blood, giving you homeostasis. So if you're changing that, you can either be changing the glucagon or insulin. So we looked at levels of both of those, and we saw no difference. So the surface fish and the cave fish make the same amount of insulin, and they make the same amount of glucagon with a fed or starved. So it's not that they're making the wrong amount of hormone, is it the sensitivity to the hormone? So type 1 diabetes is when you don't make enough insulin. Type 2 diabetes starts with insulin resistance. So are they resistant to insulin? So this is a good experiment where you just take a fish that has its normal level of blood glucose and inject insulin into it. You inject insulin into it until it equilibrates in a surface fish, it'll drive the level of blood glucose down because the insulin's getting more blood glucose taken up by the muscle and the liver. In the case, it does not go down. Not only does it go down, it actually goes up. Now, that's not a paradoxical response to insulin. The, the act of injecting a fish is stressful for a fish. Stress hormones, epinephrine and, and, and um, glucocorticoids, will, if have a stress response, will increase the level of blood sugar. But in a surface fish, the insulin you're injecting into it is enough that it overcomes that. Not only does it overcome that, it drives it down. Whereas here it's not overcoming it. So they're clearly insulin resistant. What is the cause? Oh, you can also show the insulin resistance biochemically. So this is a grossly oversimplified um, picture. I, it was a more complicated slide and I erased a lot of it because it wasn't important. This is just a slide of the glucose signal transduction pathway saying that insulin binds here. You end up phosphorylating an intermediate enzyme called AKT. And phospho-AKT leads to changes in glucose. So you can measure biochemically how sensitive a cell is to insulin by saying how much phospho-AKT is there relative to the AKT. Phospho-AKT to AKT ratio in response to insulin. And if you do that, what you find is that in two of the caves, Tanaha and Pashan, they're, insulin, they're, they're less sensitive to insulin. This is the phospho-AKT to AKT ratio. There's less phospho-AKT after treating cells in vitro with insulin from these fish than there is on the surface. 
This other cave, Molino, seems a bit different. And as um, people in the cavefish know, uh, and you may have heard from Patty, there have actually been two separate invasions of the caves. The Tanaha and Pashan caves were, were invaded by a different ancestral fish from Molino. So Molino's a bit different in a number of respects. So Molino also has glucose, um, a sort of glucose dysregulation. We don't right now know what's going on with Molino and how that happened. But in the case of Tanaha and Pashan, there's clearly an insulin resistance that's affecting this. So where, where is that insulin resistance? What's the genetic change that leads to insulin resistance? Well, we have two pieces of information we can combine. Number one, we know the insulin pathway. This is a more complete image of the insulin pathway. There's AKT again. This is a more complete image of the insulin pathway. We know all of the different proteins from lots of working humans and mice that are involved in insulin. And we have a cave fish genome. So you can go to the cave fish genome and ask for every one of these, is there a difference between the surface fish and the cave fish in the protein sequence? And one just jumped out at us. And that was the insulin receptor. So the insulin receptor, in, the, in these two Ks, not the Molino, which I said was different, but in these two Ks, there's a, leuce, a proline to leucine change in amino acids in the insulin receptor, in the insulin binding domain. It's highly, this residue is highly conserved in all vertebrates, except for these fish here. And what made it really obvious, right, as soon as we saw that mutation and did a little bit of literature reading, it was obvious that was what had to be what was going on. Because that exact same mutation, that exact same proline to leucine, has been reported in several different families that have an inherited form of severe insulin resistance. So that mutation is a change in an insulin receptor that gives you insulin resistance that's, been no, that's already known in humans. So you have a situation where in both humans and the cave fish, you've got this change. We know that it's diabetic in humans. We don't know what's going on with Tanaha and Pashan. Um, this is just a, but what we, it hadn't been explored biochemically what the effect of that mutation is. So the next slide is just to show you that that mutation does indeed decrease the binding of insulin to the receptor. It doesn't eliminate it, but decreases it. So this is a, for time, it's not, I'm not going to go through this in detail. But these are the cells that in vitro, you transfect into the cells, either the surface insulin receptor, or the Tanaha version of the insulin receptor, or you don't transfect them at all. If you don't transfect them at all, of course, they won't respond to insulin. There's no insulin receptor. So either no insulin receptor, it's not insulin receptor, or the surface one. And then you, this is a binding assay with, with fluorescein conjugated insulin. You can see that the surface binds more insulin than the Tanaha, or the, obviously, nothing there. So you have a, a mutation that we found in a, in a cave fish sequence of one fish that looks like it's an insulin resistance mutation. Is this really something that has been selected for in the caves? So we can go back to the original cave populations. Everything I've said up till now, everything I've said about fish has been with fish that have been grown in our laboratory or that we got from colleagues from their laboratories that haven't seen a cave for five generations. But you can go back to the fish in the caves and you find that in the surface, 71 sampled fish from the rivers, 100% are homozygous wild type. You go to Pashan, and 100% are homozygous with this mutation. You go to Tanaha, and most of them are homozygous. You have a few heterozygous, but no wild type. You look at a series of different caves, and this is what you see. Molino, again, doesn't have the mutation. The surface population. You never see the mutation in Molino or surface, and you never see a homozygous wild type in these caves. Clearly in these, you know, clearly in these caves there's been a strong positive selection. So strong positive selection, why is it being selected? Why do you want to have an insulin resistance gene? This is, these are fish that are happy and swimming in a cave. Well, what's good about having this mutation? Well, to see what's good about it, we want to compare fish that did or didn't have that mutation. So we looked at F2s. So we're cross a cave fish and a river fish, surface fish, get F1s, cross F1s, and get a bunch of hybrids that have a range of characteristics of the parents that are sorting independently. And then we can look at these fish and say, of the fish that inherited the insulin resistance mutation, how do they differ phenotypically from those that didn't? And we're focused, 
you, you decide to look at weight, how much the fish weigh, and to do that we only looked at males. And the reason we only looked at males is because a huge percentage of the body weight of females is the, the eggs that they're carrying. And the number of eggs that are carried in a surface fish versus a cave fish are quite different. Cave fish have fewer, larger eggs. And this is likely to be a sorting independently of the traits that we're looking at. So you'd have, you'd, uh, in an F2 population, someone would be inheriting one allele or, a different, or another allele of the egg mass thing that just confounds looking at females. So we look exclusively at males. And if you look at males, either if you're feeding them or if you're starving them, either way, if they inherit the surface allele, they weigh less than if they weigh, inherit the cave allele. Inheriting this mutation is somehow making the fish fatter. So that says, in principle, that the reason that they're selecting for this is because it, it helps them survive in this, pop, in this environment by putting on weight more quickly to get them through the starvation. The one question that you might have, though, is, is this really the cave allele that we're talking about? Because although inheriting the cave allele makes you fatter, it's possible as a genetic experiment, you could have some other gene that was really the responsible gene next door to the insulin receptor. And because they're tightly linked, they're being co-inherited. So this just tells you that, that, the, that there's something linked to the, to, the, to, to the insulin receptor mutation that's responsible for this. To show that it's really the gene mutation that's responsible, you want to go back and make the genetic change. Labs in the field are getting crisper up and running for the cave fish, but it, it, when we did the experiment, it wasn't running the cave fish, so we switched to zebrafish. So in zebrafish, we can take a zebrafish and put the cave fish insulin receptor mutation into the zebrafish. If, if you do that, um, you, they of course become insulin resistant, but that's you're, you're putting in an insulin resistance gene. But more importantly, if you put in the, the cave fish allele, the fish become fatter, fatter, and then longer. So, the strange thing here is, of course, that they're healthy. You know, this is, it's not because fish can't get diabetes. The, the zebrafish is a good model for diabetes. A lot of people are using zebrafish to study diabetes. Moreover, they get all sorts of sequelae. They get secondary complications, just as we do. They get the vascular disease. They get all the sorts of things that we do. Somehow, for some reason, you, you might think that maybe there was a trade-off in these fish. To get fatter, they're willing to take the energy storage, and it's a trade-off against having disease. But I've been telling you all along, these fish aren't diseased. You can look at, for example, um, glycation end products. So the reason that people become, lose their, their appendages, the reason you have legs amputated in diabetics, the reason diabetics go blind is not from glucose directly, but because of in a non-enzymatic way, the glucose in the blood ends up having glycated proteins. And the glycated proteins cause the damage. And although, again, Molino is different, we don't really understand it. Molino does accumulate some glycated pro end products. There's no increase in glycated proteins in the Pishan or Tanaha cave fish that carry this mutation any different from the surface fish. So, they're not, so they must have some other things that help sweep those. If they're getting higher glucose, they certainly should have glycated proteins. They must have upregulated things that get rid of them. Another thing that, between these fish is that the that we notice behaviorally. If you first inject, this is back to the glucose tolerance test. So this is where you inject the fish with <coughs> glucose so they're going to suddenly get a transiently very high level of glucose in their blood. If you do that, the river fish, the surface fish, don't like it so much. They go belly up and they're, uh, and they're dying. They recover, but they, they don't like it a lot. The cave fish, in contrast, they couldn't care less. They, they don't care that what their insulin levels are, they, I mean, they, they don't care what their glucose level is, they can have a lot more glucose, they're perfectly happy. So, and the most important thing about the, whether these are healthy fish is they live just as long. So surface fish have been grown in a lab until they senesce. This is work from Richard, our colleague Richard Borowski. After It takes about 15 years for the surface fish to senesce. They haven't had river fish, I'm uh, sorry, cave fish in the lab breeding continuously long enough to know when they senesce. But they, we know that they go 14 years without senescing. The reason we don't know exactly, they, they could be 14 because the older than 14 
because these were fish that were caught in the wild and you don't know how old they were when they were brought back, but they've been in the laboratory for 14 years. So they're living at least as long as the surface fish. So all, whatever is going on with this, they somehow managed to be able to survive it. Now why? Are there compensatory mutations that we don't know about? Are there some unique differences in the physiology that make them able to handle this? It's not clear. But what is clear is that in the cave fish, insulin resistance is an adaptive trait. Not, not something that one would have expected. So I just, the final thought I'm going to leave you with is just in general, we, all, we know that adaptive trait, when you call something adaptive trait, it's context dependent. It's contingent. So this is the classic experiments by Nachman and Hoekstra with rock pocket mice. This is an MCR mutation where you have a dark colored mouse and a light colored mouse. And they live in different environments. The dark colored mouse on the lava looks like lava. The light colored mouse on the rocks looks like rocks. But if this guy moves from the lava where he looks like lava over here, he looks like lunch. And he also looks like lunch on the other one. So that's, here it's adaptive, here it's not so adaptive. So it's context dependent. Well, this is a context dependent that's dependent at more of a genetic level. So here's a fish that was happily swimming in the river. It got swept into the caves. It stayed like either de novo mutation or pre existing mutation in, in, in the population that it got selected for and picked up a mutation for insulin resistance. But while this would be very bad in us, in one context, this, is in, this exact mutation is an inherited form of diabetes. In the cave fish, it's giving them a metabolic advantage to allow them to survive their harsh conditions. All right, so just to finish what, what I'll remind you of the people who did the work, Tyler Huck is the person who did the work on the radial organization of the gut. And this is not a Mexican cave, this is a pretty cave. It's just a cave up there. But the people who did the work on the cave, Misty Riddle and Ariel primarily, it helped some other people in collaboration with Nick Rohner and in collaboration with, close collaboration with Nick, and Richard did the work on the aging. So I will stop there and be happy to take questions. <coughs>
but the antelope sprints, but if you keep after it, it doesn't get enough time to rest. And there's still people, some of the Coney Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert in Africa, still hunt this way. My colleague Dan Lieberman, among other people, has videos of this. And this sort of pers constant pursuit hunting, but they just trot after it. And you trot, and the animal can't rest. If, it's, if, it, if, it, if it walks, you're faster than it. If it sprints, it's getting overheated because they can't thermoregulate like we can. They pant, but they can't, they don't have the, so they overheat. And after about 10 miles, they drop from heat exhaustion. And then you just come up and stick a stick in them. And so, I, so because of that, Australopithecines are on their hind legs. That, um, they, they didn't have sophisticated long distance bow and arrow surf when they had rocks to kill things. But they were probably using the sort of, you know, their anatomy is set up for long distance running. So what I'm saying is that these guys were already probably long distance runners, but they had small, smaller brains. My guess is that they would not have been as fat because they had smaller brains. And then it's, when you got the larger brains with genus Homo, as you moved into the Homo erectus and some of the other early hominid, hominins, that you probably started seeing some of the changes that made us start gaining weight. And I think that you know all of the problems that Native Americans and all of us have relate to the fact that we're just built to put on weight in a way that a lot of other animals aren't. So, so I think, but obviously, understanding the, the the genes that are involved in that deep of the, our ancestry is very difficult. Um, you know, people are doing ancient DNA work. There's one of the leaders in that field in my department, David Wright, are getting very important information on the sort of selective sweeps that took place at the change from hunting to agriculture. What gene, how do we change metabolically and physiologically when we start planting crops? Because there you can get back and do the comparisons. Right now, we can't get back to the origins quite. And comparing us to the, our living relatives, the chimps or the bonobos, they're just too far away. You don't, they're the outgroup. They're not really what we need. With respect to the first part of the talk, I thought if another silent pathway is related to orientation, the orientation of the cells could be involved a part of the movement. The signal in that way involved with the so, cellular. So, we looked at six planar cell polarity genes. There doesn't seem to be any activation of the planar cell polarity pathways in the process. So, you know, that would, that would have been the other way to do it. Instead of doing it either instead of or in addition to, instead of having physical forces, would be to have planar cell polarity genes, the way you get orientation yeah. of pair cells in your ear and so on. And I think. My guess is that the reason that, that wasn't, isn't the method that was used is because you're getting these multiple ways. I should have said, we think this, I didn't say it, but I should have, this mechanism of the stretch aligning things in one orientation seems to be a general phenomenon that's second layers going the other direction. If you look, every tube in your body that has only one layer of smooth muscle, it's always circumferential. And the other few cases where you have both directions, so the, um, the ureter, for instance, when you have both orientations. When you have both orientations, it's always the circumferential that forms first. So I think we've got some general principles that, of how they form. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't signaling pathways involved in addition, by any means. It just means that the, 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 the low-hanging fruit, the obvious thing to look at, would be planar cell polarity, the pathways that we know align orientation of cells in some other, in some other cases, and those did not seem to be involved. Thank you. And one question apart is that uh, you ever thought if thinking of echo evolvo, if the microbiome, if you take away the, the bacteria, could be changing also the the muscles in the gut? Oh, you so, so you think about so what there is data and when I talk about echo evolvo on th on Friday. No, Thursday. Thursday. Um, one of the examples I'll talk about is that there is a, an interaction in terms of the vasculature of the villi. So getting the vascularization of the villi in the kind of the microbiome. Um, the problem with it for the, the, 
from the, the things that we're talking about in terms of microbiome, is everything that I talk about happens embryonically. So there is no food in the gut. Yeah. So w when the muscle layers are forming and being established, at that stage, the animal, the, if it's a mammal, it's living off of, of food from the mother. These are chickens, it's living off of yellow. But there is no, there is no microbiome at all. Yeah, I, I thought about that because I've seen uh, pictures of uh, guts, the slices of guts that have been without bacteria in uh, infants and recent born animals, that they have uh, the veli very short. Yes. Yeah, and I thought it could be related with yeah, so, so that that seems, that's so, so, As I said, that, that seems to be a vascular issue. So that they don't get vascularized, yeah. so they can't support them. Uh -huh. There are blood vessels, loops of blood vessels that go into each one. It, it's kind of a weird style of say it more detail on um, Thursday. But the story there is, and it's nothing to do with my work, but the story is that there's a bacteria that is, tries to get rid of its competitors, the other bacteria. And it induces the immune system to make angiotensin, which is being made because the other bacteria don't like it. So it's, it's getting rid of the other bacteria. That's why the bacteria is doing it. The bacteria doesn't care about blood vessels. The problem is, if it did that and you didn't compensate, you'd get too much, because it, it leads to the production of blood vessels, you'd have too many blood vessels. So we've evolved on the assumption that that bacteria is going to be there to now rely on it. If it's not there, you don't have that symbiosis, you don't have the things for it. It's, yeah, so my, the microbiome I, I probably does play into the metabolism of these guys. And certainly, although we are interested in looking at whether there's any genetic differences, my lab and also the a le a laboratory in, in Hawaii are both looking at the cavefish genetics to see if it influences the microbiome, if they're seeing the same bacteria. But, Patty and others are looking at the microbiome in the caves. They're going to have, you know, the water's a different temperature, it's a different pH, it's got different connectivity, it's got different other animals living in different trash in the places. You're going to have different bacteria in the two places, and that's got to lead to differences in, in the flora of the gut. And we, we know that, that the flora of the gut influences the animals, so it would be very surprising if there weren't some metabolic consequences of the differences in the microbiome relating more to the second half of the story. Uh, for the first half, since we're talking about embryological processes, you know, the, the developmental side of my lab, so the, the evolutionary side of my lab sometimes has adult organisms. We work in cave fish. We've worked previously on jerboas. We looked a little bit at Darwin's finches at one point. We, there we think about adult organisms, but the developmental half of my lab, we just look at embryos. So, um, you know, if an animal hatches, I get mad at the student who let it hatch. Thank you. Okay, so we are running out of time, but let's thank Dr. Kagan and we have a coffee outside here so we can discuss this more. Thank you.